good afternoon, everyone. Uh, like yesterday, today's Hello Lecture is not at the usual time, <laughs> but it's less than uh, 26 years. Uh, the Hello Lecture started in 2002 uh, when uh, Morgan and Michael Heller from London made a donation that allowed the Interdisciplinary Center for Neural Computation, the ICMC, to establish a high-profile series of lectures. Things changed since. The ICMC conformed into ESPEC. Michael Heller was knight knighted in 2013, and I met him last year, and he was not in armor with a sword. Uh -huh. <laughs> Very disappointed. Uh, in spite of that, or because of that, or independent of that, the le lecture series continue today. Um, the, it, the, the Hello Lecture Series in Computational and Neuroscience rapidly became one of the most prestigious lecture series at the Hebrew University. They cover a range of topics that reflect the interest of researchers at ESPEC, from molecular and cellular to systems, cognitive psychology, modeling, and philosophy. Each year, leading researchers visit ESPEC for a few days and deliver two talks, a technical presentation at the seminar and this uh, uh, more wider, a more wide uh, uh, presentation. So the Hebrew University and in particular ELSEC are indebted to the Hello for their vision and innovation. Today's Hello lecturer is Professor Christine Pekli <coughs> from the Pasteur Institute and the Collège de France. Christine is undoubtedly the most important geneticist of the auditory system uh, working today. I could repeat her uh, here her long list of accomplishments, but I decided to concentrate on just a few. First, she's a member of the French Academy of Sciences and a foreign member of the US Academy of Sciences. She's also a <laughs> officier de l'ordre de la de la Come on. <laughs> <laughs> There are many officers around if you want to talk with them. <laughs> That uh, it, this doesn't have a real equivalent in, uh, in Israel, but would be comparable to having the uh, Israel Prize. The Israel Prize. No. Uh, yeah. <laughs> ah, this, this one is the American Academy, because I use it. This <laughs> one. <laughs> this last one. <laughs> of the Academy. She's a recipient, yeah, she's a recipient of uh, numerous uh, scientific prizes which I, I will mention only two. The first is the Brain Prize that she got in 2012, sharing it with Karen, Karen Steele from the UK. And just to put it in perspective, the Brain Prize is order of a Nobel Prize, if you wish. It started in 2011, so 2012 was the second time it was awarded. And for those of you who, uh, most of us uh, understand what I'm going to say now, the opto opto uh, uh, yeah. uh, genetics and the calcium imaging system got yeah. deflated mm -hmm. okay, in 2013 and 2015. Mm -hmm. Second, she received this year the World of Merit of the Association of Research for Research in Motor Neurology. That's the major professional uh, society of uh, auditory research in the world. And uh, why this award is not as important as the bank prize, it is the highest honor that the auditory community can give. And also, as of this morning, I checked Christine's age index. It was 90, nine zero for all of you. That's all we judge. You know more than I know. <laughs> I, I, I do. I never look to that. Okay. The only <laughs> fact that only witnessed the excellence of Christine's research and its groundbreaking nature, I want to say one word about Christine's science. Uh, my point of view is that of someone working at the intersection of network systems and computational neuroscience and somewhat uh, away from genetics. To me, it looks as if in Christine's hands, genetics served not as a goal in itself, but rather as a tool. A tool for asking questions about brain, and a very specific question at that, the question of how the inner ear works. Christine spearheaded a revolution in the way that we understand not genetics, but audition. I can hardly imagine a greater interdisciplinary success story which I consider an example for us all. So, before the lecture, I have to give you this. So, this is a certificate of the Heller Lecture Series. Okay. 
There, lecture series in computational neuroscience, award the certificate of recognition and appreciation to Professor Christine Petit for her contribution to academic inquiry and exchange at the Edmond and Lily Sapper Center for Brain Sciences and so on and so forth. So, Many thank thanks. You. <laughs> Thank you, Christine, for coming, and please, we are waiting for you. So, good afternoon, everyone, and many thanks, uh, Ellie, for your warm work of introduction. Um, I really appreciate, and um, I think that maybe you did too much. Okay. So, what I will discuss uh, today um, is, let's say, the road from the understanding of the underlying deficit of the hereditary forms of deafness to the emergence of curative therapy, and I will focus on gene therapies. So, as I mentioned yesterday, during the course of, ev of human evolution, an unparalleled ability to make sense of sound emerged with the development of language and music. And this elevated hearing to its unique status of primary sense of human communication. So in children profoundly deaf at birth, the switch from an innate bubble to spontaneous language acquisition is defective. Today, we are fascinating by the temporal resolution. I am fascinating, I must say, by the temporal resolution of the auditory system. We are fascinated by the ability to the sensory system to detect very small gaps in a sound sequence. We are fascinated by the coincidence detector neuron detecting, let's say, a delay of 10 to 15 microseconds between sounds are, uh, um, arriving um, to uh, the, the, the two ears. We are also fascinated, let's say, by the way octopus cells in the posteroventral cochlear nucleus are able, let's say, to synchronize the information coming from different places of the cochlea, which in fact emerge with a certain time delay due to the traveling of the wave, the sound wave, the, the wave propagated in response to sound. However, the system as other characteristics, for instance, as I was mentioning yesterday, it is able to detect an acoustic energy barely exceeding the thermal noise. And uh, this has really, um, uh, this was really a main issue since, let's say, the cochlea is filled with liquid that will in a way damp any mechanical simulation. So how is it possible that the, the, the auditory system is so sensitive? The auditory system is also, um, has also a remarkable spectral resolution reaching to one in a thousand for, certain, for some frequencies in human. And surprisingly, the hearing properties were initially studied by physicists and biophysicists who mostly explore the response to pure tone, single frequency tone, and focused on the peripheral auditory system. Here are the portraits of some of these scientists, and they uncovered a lot of basic principles. First of all, they uncover the basic principle of sound frequency analysis in the cochlea. They uncover also the basic principle of the amplification of sound stimulation in the cochlea. This has been done by Thomas Gold, and let's say he um, postulated the existence of an amplifier 
within the cochlea. But let's say this publication, this hypothesis, well, let's say, did not, uh, um, was almost overlooked, and finally, he left the field of audition to move to astrophysics. So finally, also, uh, they were able, and I am referring to, uh, particularly to Lord Rayleigh, to uh, um, decipher the principle of sound source localization in the azimuthal plan. So altogether, at the beginning of the 1990s, much was known about the biophysics and the physiology of the peripheral auditory system, but th the underlying molecular mechanism of sound processing in the cochlea and its innervation was virtually unknown. So, this is why we decided, let's say, as I was mentioning yesterday, to develop a molecular approach of this mechanism. So before discussing inherited deafness, a brief introduction on hearing impairment. There is growing awareness of the hearing impairment as a major worldwide public health, uh, public health issue. First of all, hearing impairment is the most frequent sensory defect. At birth, profound deafness, which is all mostly of genetic origin, affects one in 700 newborns. Let's say in teenagers are at risk of developing hearing impairment and also young adults. According to WHO, 1.1 million billion people are at, least at risk of developing hearing loss due to overexposure to loud, loud music, so, so in recreational setting. And at all ages, overexposure to noise in overcrowded city can cause hearing loss. And let's say there is uh, some indication that by 2050, 80% of the, the entire population of the world will live in this type of out, uh, overcrowded city. Let's say in aging people, presbycusi is highly prevalent. By 2050, uh, for uh, 450 million people will we, likely develop an hearing loss, and the key point is the fact that hearing loss, this type of hearing loss, leads to a very rapid loss of cognitive function. So this is altogether, this is a transgenerational health problem. So deafness may be isolated or associated with other symptoms and is called syndromic deafness. The prevalence of hearing impairment increases suddenly with age. Here you can see the prevalence uh, as a function of age with the col color code indicating some mild, moderate, and severe forms of deafness. So as you can see here, and this, in, uh, let's say this histogram, in fact, has been published in the 1980s. There is really with a, uh, um, a major increase of hearing impairment with age. So hearing impairment has a very different uh, um, impact on individuals. Early onset forms of deafness lead to important difficulty in oral, oral language acquisition, in increased risk of underperforming at school, and limited professional opportunities. Later set form of deafness lead to social isolation, loss of social links, depressive syndrome, and as I already mentioned, and this is really a key point, a rapid decline of cognitive functions. So, the Heligenstadt Testament, a letter from Ludwig van Beethoven to one of his brothers, provides an eloquent testimony of this effect. 
I quote, for me, there can be no recreation in society of my fellows, refined intercourse, mutual exchanges of thought. I must live like an exile. Inherited forms of deafness as any disorder can be either monogenic, meaning that a single gene is responsible when defective for deafness. It can be due to, to it can involve two genes, so having a degenic inheritance. It can involve several genes leading to oligogenic inheritance. It can involve number of variants leading to multigenic forms, and if these multigenic forms are associated with, for instance, environmental factors, these forms of deafness can be both multigenic and multifactorial. The congenital, the congenital and early onset form of deafness are mainly monogenic forms of deafness, and I discussed them extensively yesterday. So there are very few forms of degenic inheritance, and most of the congenital forms of deafness are monogenic and, let's say, inherited on an autosomal recessive mode, whereas the, um, the forms of deafness which, um, let's say, have an hearing onset in young adults tend to be inherited on an autosomal dominant uh, mode. So for the late onset form of deafness, especially for presbycusi, there are indications from the involvement of genetic factors as well as some environmental factors and mainly noise. So for several reasons, I have, that I have no time to discuss, and I already discussed yesterday, we initiated our genetic study through the analysis of large consanguineous families affected by uh, deafness, profound forms of deafness, and living in geographic isolates. Here we are in Tunisia, and we also worked, as I mentioned, in Jordan, Lebanon, Algeria, Morocco, and today also in Mauritania. So, we pull out about 20 genes responsible for deafness, some being responsible for isolated forms of deafness, others being responsible for syndromic forms of deafness. Today, thanks to the effort of numerous labs worldwide, more than 100 genes causing monogenic forms of deafness have been isolated and similar number and even higher number of genes responsible for syndromic forms of deafness have been isolated. Some of the genes being responsible, depending from one mutation to another, of both an isolated form of deafness and a syndromic form of deafness. As a consequence, let's say, of the, the isolation of these genes, molecular diagnosis for inherited deafness has been developed and is still developing in a number of countries, allowing uh, to predict, in some, first of all, to say, in a family having a, a single child being affected by deafness, that deafness is of genetic origin, and to be able to inform about the risk of recurrence for the other children. So, I'll briefly introduce the peripheral auditory system because all the inherited forms of deafness, as I already mentioned yesterday, are due to defect taking place in the peripheral auditory system, in the cochlea, and or in the spiral ganglion neuron innervating the sensory hair cells. So in brief, we are here within the inner ear, with the two sensory organs, the cochlea and the vestibule, the balance organ. Here a cross-section, scheme of a cross-section of the cochlea. You see here the auditory sensory epithelium with the inner air cell, 
which send encoded information to the central auditory system via the spiral ganglion neuron. Here the outer air cell, which are the cochlea amplifier. So briefly, the receptive structure to sound stimulation is the air bundle that you see here, which is composed of protrusion filled with actin filament called the stereocilia, which are organized in three rows of increasing height. Here is an open cochlea. At the surface of the sensory epithelium, you can see at the back the air bundle of the inner air cell and at the front the air bundle of the outer air cell. And above, there is a membrane, membrane and a cellular membrane to, um, uh, called the tectorial membrane, which is in fact associated to the air bundle of the outer air cell, and you can see here the imprint, the imprint of the air bundle. So just to remind you uh, about the way the cochlea works and about the outer air cells, the way they work, the, the important point is the fact that the, the cochlea amplifier, which is a function which is ensured by the outer air cell, is a non-linear amplifier. The fainter sound, the stronger the amplification. So, at the bottom right here, you see that each row of stereocilia is represented by a single stereocilium, and in response to sound, let's say the air bundle will oscillate, creating a tension in this link called the tip link that will propagate up to the mechanotransduction channel here indicated in red and located at the tip of the small and the medium stereocilia row. So, the cochlea, as I mentioned already yesterday, and you all know that, cannot directly be observed in patients, and the clinical auditory tests are poorly informative. Therefore, we entirely rely on animal models to elucidate the, the underlying pathogenic mechanism for each form of deafness. An animal model, let's say, is a genetically engineered animal carrying mutation in the same gene as the gene responsible for deafness in humans. As many, we concentrated on the mouse mutants, and as far as we can tell, with very few exceptions, they faithfully mimic the hearing defect observed in humans. Understanding the role of the protein encoded by the deafness genes is absolutely critical to develop some therapeutic approach. Which are the target cells of the deficit? What are the various steps of the, uh, the setting up of the cellular defect? Does this defect have a consequence on the other cells? Do the cells survive? And how long? Answering this question, as I, I was just saying, is absolutely critical for, a cura for developing curative therapies. Moreover, all cochlear component tissue a cellular gel, the tectorial membrane, liquid, vibrate in response to acoustic stimulation. And this vi vibration generates waves that propagate in the cochlea. And in addition, there are active processes, let's say the amplification, generated by the outer air cell, meaning that there is an interplay between these mechanical forces, which is essential for sound processing. As a consequence, we can only properly address the consequence of the deletion of a gene responsible for deafness in an in vivo context. This is why animal models are so important in this perspective. In these animal models, an understanding of the function of the protein encoded by deafness genes can be obtained only by multidisciplinary exploration of the animal models. This calls for the state of art of imaging technique, together with biophysical 
ex vivo, in vivo electrophysiology associated with cell biology and also in vitro biochemical approaches. And in terms of electrophysiology, a key point as with respect, let's say, of the uh, air cell physiology is the recording of the mechanoelectrical transduction uh, current, which involves the stimulation of the air bundle and the recording, let's say, uh, by patch lamp analysis. So, here are the deafness genes and the pathophysiological, the pathophysiological classification. So, first of all, as you can see here, there is this long list of proteins which are expressed in the air bundle. Second, there are also some deafness genes with, which are encoding components which compose this tectorial membrane we have just seen, which is absolutely essential for stimulating the air bundle of the outer air cell and to some extent the air bundle of the inner air cell. And let's say, through the genetic approach, a number of components of this extracellular matrix have been uh, discovered. So there are also, as we have seen yesterday, a number of deafness genes that result in synaptic defect. Also, there are some resulting in a problem in cell-cell adhesion, especially between the air cell and their supporting cell. There are, in addition, some ionic homeostasis defects, and uh, let's say, which are absolutely critical, this ionic homeostasis uh, is absolutely critical to maintain, let's say, um, the, the driving force of the mechanotransduction current. And finally, I'd like to mention the role of number of the genes responsible for deafness in the oxidative stress and especially the oxidative stress generated in response to noise. So here you can see how different are the, uh, are the morphology of the air bundle in some mouse model of human deafness. The air bundle can be misoriented, it can be completely misshaped, it can be disrupted, it can be too short, the stereocilia can be fused, or let's say just the apex of the stereocilia can be abnormal. So, so far, there is no curative treatment for hearing impairment. Only auditory prosthesis can be proposed to patients. The conventional hearing aid, which amplify the sound stimulation, and also the cochlear implants. Cochlear implants are implanted neuroprosthetic electronic devices, which is shown here. A microphone pick up acoustic signal and transfer it to a um, sound microprocessor, a speech microprocessor, in fact. And thereafter, the output of the speech microprocessor is transferred through the, the skin to a decoder, which, as output, will deliver an electrical signal to electrodes, which are, as a decoder, implanted within the head. So the electrodes will stim stimulate, let's say, the spiral ganglion neuron. So one of the issues is, let's say, are all of the deafness form, can all of the deafness form benefit from cochlear implant? To answer this question, we need to clarify for each form of deafness what is the underlying pathogenic mechanism. And I will illustrate the point through an example. Several years ago, in fact, two to three, more than that, we concentrated on a form of deafness responsible for profound deafness and a form in which the transmission uh, is on an autosomal recessive form. We focus on this form of deafness because we are very much interested 
uh, in uh, uh, what is called auditory neuropathies, that I and I like to mention that this is the only form of deafness that we can distinguish so far from the other forms of deafness. So I show you why we initially uh, are inter we, we were initially interested in this deafness form because we thought that we were dealing with an auditory neuropathy. I mentioned yesterday another auditory neuropathy related to autoferlin defect in which only the inner ear is affected, meaning that the activity of the outer air cell is preserved and thus this form of deafness is classified as auditory neuropathy. But there are other forms of auditory neuropathy and there is today much focus on auditory neuropathy because it seems that in response to other exposure to noise, the, uh, the nerve are the primary target of the deficit and therefore, in response, there is a development of an auditory neuropathy. So initially, we thought that Pechvakin could be a standard neuropathy. The protein was unknown, it unco the, the protein was unknown, so we, we name it Pechvakin. It's a small protein, it has no known domain or motif, and it shares some homologies. This is really interesting with another protein encoded by, uh, a protein encoded by another deafness gene responsible for a dominant form of deafness. Other families have since, as, after our first report, were described. The auditory phenotypes were very diverse. So initially, we saw that the diversity could be related to the type of mutation. Up to a point, we observe that with the same mutation, some patients have pre pre prelingual profound deafness with what it seems to be a pure auditory neuropathy, whether, uh, whereas the others have a completely different uh, phenotype with severe to profound deafness, but no persistence of an activity of the outer air cell as it can be detected by the distortion product of autoacoustic emission. So we start wondering why this. In order to answer this question, we developed a mouse model in which we inactivated these genes. And we examined the response, the auditory response of these knockout mice. First of all, in control mice, here in blue, as you can see here, the auditory threshold is what we expect. In contrast, in knockout mice for Pechvakin, the auditory threshold is elevated, but it's, uh, it's, really, the, um, it's really scattered in the sense that it extends from 100 decibel from 40 decibel up to 100 decibel. What about the distortion product of autoacoustic emission? About, let's say, what about their threshold? I'd like to remind you about the distortion product of autoacoustic emission. Here, in response to two frequencies, which are quite close, F1 and F2, there are some intermodulation products which are generated by the outer air cell, and the most prominent one has a frequency to F1 and F2. It travels back to, let's say, the middle ear and the external ear, and this sound can be recorded by a small microphone. Because this response is generated by outer air cell, it is considered by clinicians as a very good measure of the activity of the outer air cell. So looking to the threshold of this um, distortion product of photoacoustic emission, we observe again an elevation of the threshold by scattering of this uh, threshold. So this could be due either to a genetic background, because let's say these mutant mice do not have the same genetic background, or it could be due to the environment. 
We notice that the hearing threshold was higher when large number of pups were housed together in the same cage box. It's known that pups are vocally very active from birth to about postnatal day 20, particularly when they crown around the mother at feeding time. Therefore, this suggested that the natural acoustic environment with call from the large number of pups might be deleterious in this knockout mice for Pejvakin. So we decided to investigate this point and to this purpose, we put together either two pups, four pups, eight pups, or 10 pups with a foster mother and we examine the ABR threshold. And we observe that the ABR threshold was correlated to the number of pups per cage. We directly probe a role of, let's say, of uh, acoustic uh, exposure in the elevation of the threshold of pejvakin deficient mice. Here, let's say, the control animals have been exposed to, uh, um, let's say, um, an, an acoustic stimulation, a short acoustic stimulation there is no modification of the hearing threshold, but in Pejvakin deficient mice, there is a huge elevation of the, uh, of the hearing threshold. So this shows that these animals are hyper vulnerable to sound. So we use conditional knockout in the hair cell, in the spiral ganglion neuron, also direct stimulation of the spiral ganglion neurons, in order to examine which cells are in the auditory system are hyper vulnerable to sound in Pejvakin deficient mice. To cut a long story short, we could come up with the following conclusion, inner air cell, outer air cell, spiral ganglion neuron are hyper vulnerable to sound and even to very low energy of sound. So here is the response, the ABR response, and you can see here before sound exposure, after sound exposure, this is recorded in Pejvakin deficient mice for a loud sound, but only for three minutes of exposure in a cage, which is equivalent of having 12 pups in a cage. As you can see here, in response to sound exposure, there is an increase of the delay between wave one and wave four, and also the amplitude decrease. Is it relevant to patients? So, we ask ENT doctors to examine patients in this perspective, and we ask to the ENT doctor to record the response, the ABR response, in a standard way that is normally in response to 1,000 clicks. But to stop and monitor, let's say, the response after 250 clicks and 550 clicks. As you can see here, the response in patients having a mutation in the Pejvakin gene is normal with 250 clicks, is still almost normal with 550 clicks, but vanish, let's say, uh, in presence of normal, uh, let's say, number of clicks used, 1,000, and also the delay between the, the waves on large. So patients were thereafter uh, transferred to a quiet room for 10 minutes, and again, this, they were tested for the response to click in a standard ABR procedure. We can see here that the response to 250 clicks is now normal. The uh, response to 500 clicks is now abnormal and to 1,000 clicks is also abnormal. So this means that in this patient also, and we could go to the conclusion that inner air cell, outer air cell, and spiral ganglion neurons are also hyper vulnerable to sound even when exposed to low energy sound. To cut a long story short, we have observed that this protein is associated with peroxisome, as you can see here. 
This point we could also show that in response to sound stimulation, what has never been observed before, due to the oxidative stress, there is an adaptative proliferation of peroxisomes, as you can see here, in normal mice before and after exposure to sound, the number of peroxisomes. This was true in inner air cell, outer air cell, and auditory neurons, whereas in the absence of pejvakin, let's say not only there is no proliferation of the peroxisome, but the number of peroxisome decreased. So, altogether, this indicates, first of all, that uh, in the absence of this pejvakin protein, more we stimulate the system, more it gets affected. So if you translate that to patient, this predicts in such a case that cochlear implant not only will not be beneficial, but likely will be detrimental. So I think that we have now to, be, to examine for each patient which has been, uh, for patient which has been cochlear implanted, what are the results of the cochlear implant and draw some parallelism between the type of mutation present in patients and the result of the cochlear implant. In a way, in the future, not to propose cochlear implantation to these patients. But it goes without saying that new therapies, and especially gene therapy that I will now discuss, are important to develop for a number of deafness forms, including this particular one. So your tail sir, could cure deafness, wrote Shakespeare. Today, scientific innovations are promising. I'd like to show that. I will concentrate on gene therapy. Gene delivery is a therapeutic approach in which genetic abnormalities are corrected either by restoring native functional activity or by removing a detrimental function through the process of delivering exogenous genetic material to the host, to the host target cells. So this strategy possesses the potential to provide a direct solution to a disorder rather than treating its symptoms. So, first of all, how to deliver the gene in the cochlea? Systemic delivering has been tested and the results seem rather poor, except if you are injecting a high concentration of genes, which in parallel lead to the development of some toxicity. So, most of the people try to inject directly the therapeutic genes, or let's say the genetic, uh, um, let's say, two um, agents within the inner ear. Most of them are trying to inject at the level of the round window, others are trying, so within the perilance, others are trying to inject directly within the underlands, and it seems that one of the interesting approach is to inject within the vestibule. A key point is the, to try not to create any brush within the neuroepithelium in the cochlea in order to avoid the depolarization of the cells that could lead to death and also to have a rundown of the endocochlear potential. So by using an approach in the vestibule, it seems that first of all, the, the therapeutic agent diffuses quite well and we don't have to face this problem. So the spectrum of the gene therapy strategies are the following one. First of all, gene replacement strategy by transferring cDNA. This can be used 
for recessive or dominant monogenic form of deafness, for monogenic form of deafness, especially in case of haploinsufficiency. Gene therapy targeting of mRNA translation of pre-mRNA by using RNA interference, microRNA, inducing translation arrest, double strand RNA for degrading, let's say, uh, the mutant transcript, and this use one of the uh, RNA's enzyme called decipher, using antisense therapy, uh, especially synthetic oligonucleotide, and I've uh, uh, had the pleasure to discuss with one of your colleagues, which seems to be able to cure, or they have some hope to cure, cystic fibrosis through this approach. But the interesting thing is that she's using a very small amount of uh, antisense uh, oligonucleotide. Finally, although it's not very well developed, there is indication of the possibility to use a um, drug which is able to overread in frame nonsense mutation. So these type of therapies are developed for dominant forms of deafness. And in the perspective, there is a genome editing, also called genome surgery, using CRISPR-Cas9. It should be the ideal uh, way to cure, let's say, because you will just modify and, let's say, have the proper chance of the mutation, and you don't have to worry about the gene, for instance, uh, expressing several transcripts, encoding several isoforms, which is a problem for gene, which can be a problem for gene replacement. So, moreover, in this perspective, genome editing has, let's say, the great advantage to be able to cure multigenic forms of disorder, and in our case, for instance, that could be very useful for presbycusis. So, microRNA strategy has been tested in an animal model for human deafness, and these animal models have been called Beethoven. So, Beethoven is a mutation which is located in this um, protein, let's say, this is a missense mutation, in this protein which has six transmembrane domains and which is a TMC protein. Uh, in order to, um, let's say, to knock down the expression of the mutated form of the gene, let's say, you can see here that uh, a small mRNA sequence was used, which was an, uh, embedded in an artificial microRNA scaffold. All the microRNA which have been, te have been tested, and finally, only one turn, turn out to be efficient in vitro. So, it has then been tested in vivo using the following protocols. At postnatal day zero or two, viral uh, inoculation in which the virus was, let's say, expressing uh, this microRNA was injected within the cochlea. And after, there had been a monitoring of the auditory function uh, from postnatal day 10 up to 26 weeks. To cut a long story short, what has been observed is the following things. First of all, here in black, you can see the ABR threshold in wild type mice. You can see here the controls, that is animal, mutated animals, with, which received either a microRNA, which is called SAFE, which is just a control, or the injection has been performed in the control lateral here, and you can see the ABR threshold progressing with time. Through the injection of the microRNA, what, is, what was observed is the fact that it's only delay, in fact, the development of the hearing loss. So this was substantiated by a more careful analysis, but basically the take-home message is that so far 
no interesting re strong results, let's say, has been obtained through the injection of microRNA within the, co within the cochlea. So vectors have been extensively tested. First of all, lantivirus vectors. So they are able to infect the great interest of the lantivirus vector is that they are able to infect both dividing and non-dividing cells and they can house a large, large cDNA up to 8 kilobase. However, there is a caveat in the sense that so far lantivirus are unable to transduce hair cells, but they transduce other cells. And as we have seen, in certain form of deafness, the hearing defect is not due to a defect at the level of the hair cell, but for instance at the level of the stria vascularis, at the level of the supporting cell, as a, at the level of the fibroblast for the connexin. So it could be used for some form of deafness, but not for hair cell defect. Adenovirus vectors. Adenovirus vectors, they are able, let's say, they contain a double strand genome which uh, span um, 36 kilobase. So in humans, there are two major serotypes which are used, two and five. They, in fact, they transduce both dividing and non-dividing cells. However, there is one limitation due to the fact that injected in the cochlea, within the underlying, for instance, they are just able to transduce some cells along, let's say, which are forming this epithelium, but not the sensory cell. So, adenovirus, adenovirus associated vector, or AAV, as you may know, is very much used in all gene therapy protocol, gene, gene therapy trial, which are now extremely numerous. This, uh, the genome, the AAV genome, can persist as episome state by forming high molecular weight by, let's say, um, associating, uh, being able to concat forming concatemer, uh, head and tail con concatemer, and it has the possibility to very efficiently transduce hair cells there is only one caveat, which is due to the fact that it can only house a cDNA with um, a size not exceeding 4.5 kilobase, 4.5, 4.8 kilobase. Yesterday, I discussed a lot the Usher syndrome and like, and like to mention what we have been observed trying to reverse the Usher syndrome. We concentrated on one, iso one form of Usher, Usher syndrome type 1G, which encodes SANS, which is composed of four anterior repeat and a SAM domain. We use the following AV vector, which has a genome derived from AV2 and a capsid derived from AV8. First of all, we control that the injection of the virus as no in the wild type mice did not modify the hearing threshold in the uh, animals. And we could confirm that we did not generate some trauma, uh, trauma by injecting this um, virus. So the abandon of these animals has some anomalies. As you can see here, here are the wild type air bundle, and here the air bundle of mutant mice, let's say disrupted in two or three or three clumps. And let's say in the at the level of the vestibule, here is the air bundle, and in the mutant mice for this Usher 1G gene, you can see how the air bundle of the vestibular air cell is disorganized. In response, let's say, when we examine the mechanotransduction, we observe that in the absence of sense, there is no mechanoelectrical transduction. So, we transfer this gene in the cochlea by using AV vector, and we observe the following thing. First of all, 
we restore, and it was really a surprise because we were not expecting to restore, let's say, the morphology of, the, uh, of most of the air bundle because, let's say, the, 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 um, the morphological anomalies detected in the mutant mice are really very important with, let's say, the disruption of the air bundle. Anyway, we could observe both in the cochlea and in the vestibule at the level of the utricle that upon injection of this adenovirus vector, the air bundle was restored at least partially. What about the mechanoelectrical transduction in the hair cell? So we recorded inner and outer hair cells. We used, because as you have probably noticed, the vector express a reported gene, a GSP, and by recording the mechanotransduction in GSP positive cells, we could observe that the amplitude of the currents was recovered. In addition, the, um, the current displacement curve was also entirely normal. We examined the, res uh, the response at the level of the vestibule. So here you can see normal mice swimming. Here, knockout mice. So we cannot let them because uh, they are unable to swim. Here, in heterozygous mice injected by the recombinant vector, this is normally. Oh, sorry. And here, the homozygous mutant injected. This is normal. So, we could conclude to a full restoration of the vestibular functions that I will not discuss in two details. So as I was mentioning, the key problem with the adenovirus vector is the fact that the vector cannot house a large piece of DNA. And the number of genes defective and responsible for deafness are encoding large proteins. However, it has been recently developed a system in which you can, have the, you can clone in two pieces or even in three pieces a cDNA and using a dual adenovirus vector gene therapy try to restore a complete cDNA. We have undertaken this approach for the gene encoding autoferlin that I mentioned yesterday and we obtain the following results. These results are not yet published. As you can see here, there is first of all in autoferlin deficient mice a restoration of the response in um, the auditory brain response. And if you look to the threshold, there is a rescue. And the interesting thing is that it's, uh, it's uncovered in fact um, uh, all the frequencies and the important thing is this, this is a robust restoration which lasts let's say at least 30 months so we are almost as, as, as I'm saying almost ready to envisage to try to cure let's say deafness in the corresponding patients so I'd like just to end up by briefly mentioning genome editing strategy, which has been developed during the last, la during the last decade, with um, the particular development of the CRISPR-Cas9 system, which simplifies a lot the system used before by the use of a single uh, guide RNA. So this system is a very promising system and I was mentioning why before. So it has, however, a limit. The major problem being the possibility of having out-of-target um, mutations. To ensure, to try 
to um, increase, let's say, the, to, uh, to be able to better use the CRISPR-Cas9 system, now there are some development which instead of using uh, AAV vector or any type of viral vector, tend to use non-viral delivery of the CRISPR-Cas9 and the RNA guide. Why this? Because in this particular situation, contrary to the other situation, you don't want the, Casper, uh, the, the, Cas, the Cas9 being expressed longer. So having it delivered as a protein, for instance, in a cationic liposome with just the guide, this is a way not to have the Cas9 being able to work repetitively uh, um, and to uh, increase, for instance, the out of target and even to modify repetitively the, the site targeted. So today, there are some modifications um, which are developed to have less and less out of target um, uh, deletion introduced by Casper Cas9. And I think that the way this is developed using, let's say, uh, cationic um, uh, lipids, uh, lipid membrane, and the protein plus the RNA guide is quite promising, and it has been reported in the inner ear where it has been injected. The result was not e extremely good in the sense that the hearing threshold was not very much modified, but this is a start, and I think that's a promising start. So, to end up, I'd like to briefly mention the role of the animal models. To, why do we need an animal model? For sure, to develop and evaluate the modes of delivery of the therapeutic genes with minimal trauma in the inner ear. To test the therapeutic potential and in, uh, efficiency, duration of the effect, and also the toxicity and to test the secondary effect and especially the possibility of out-of-target for genome editing. Animal models, mouse are easy, but we are facing a specific problem with mouse model in the sense that hearing onset in mouse model is very different than what it is in humans. In mouse, let's say the cochlea, the hearing onset, is occurring at, at around postnatal day 12, whereas it developed in utero in humans at around seven months. So we don't know when we examine, let's say, um, the histology of the cochlea in mouse model, whether or not it is a, um, uh, um, it's really mimicking the state, or let's say, uh, the pathophysiology stage of the cochlea after birth in humans. So in order to circumvent this problem, people are developing large mammals as animal models with pig, mini pig, and goat. Of course, there is a cost problem. And also, we tend to use more and more non-human primates, at least to evaluate the biodistribution of the therapeutic agents agent and also to evaluate the possibility of the out-of-target modification by the CRISPR-Cas9 uh, system. So finally, here is my team at the Pasteur Institute, and I'd like to point Saïd Safiadin with his collaborators, and especially uh, uh, Marlene Ampos, which is la uh, very much uh, involved in uh, gene therapy, and also, I'd like to point a number of people who are also uh, involved in some other aspects. For instance, Cédiré Del Magani and also uh, Jean de Fourny, who work uh, uh, on uh, Pech vaccine. And also, I'd like to uh, thank our collaborators throughout the world. And finally, uh, our sponsor, and many thanks for your attention. I will be pleased to answer your questions.